can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. We'll be in Leviticus beginning in chapter 4. That's page 82 in the Bibles under chairs and pews around the room. So if you don't have a Bible, please grab one. If you don't own a Bible, please grab that and then take it with you. We'd love for you to have that as your own copy of God's Word. Uh, we believe that the Bible, the whole Bible, is inspired and inerrant, which means inspired doesn't just mean authors kind of had this inspiration to write. Inspired means it's breathed out by God. Um, it is God's very Word, and we believe that it's without error because when God speaks, He speaks the truth. And we believe that's true about Leviticus as well, and it's an often dismissed book, uh, not just neglected, but uh, rejected in many ways. And so, we're going to, in this series, just take this seriously. Uh, we believe that this is God's Word, and it's profitable and useful for us, and so we're looking to God to prove that uh, to us over this uh, series. Well, as we move into a post-Christian culture, people are eager to leave many uh, Christian ideas behind. Of course, they're not leaving all of them behind. Things like universal human rights, compassion for the vulnerable, and so forth uh, are from Jesus and His influence in our culture. But one of the concepts that uh, people are quickly wanting to leave behind is the word and the concept of sin. But as Christians, we can't get rid of that. I love John Stott's little book, Confess Your Sins. I've mentioned it over the years often. I return to it often. His first sentence addresses the concern with that word, sins, in his title. Some will say it's an indication that Christians are preoccupied with their sins. But then he, he wrote this, there is no need for us to be offended by this criticism. We are not in the least ashamed of the fact that we think and talk a lot about sin. We do so for the simple reason that we are realists. Sin is an ugly fact. It is to be neither ignored nor ridiculed, but honestly faced. Indeed, Christianity is the only religion in the world which takes sin seriously, right? This problem of the human condition that takes it seriously and offers a satisfactory remedy for it. So, Christians take sin seriously, and we know that Jesus is a satisfying and satisfactory remedy for it. But the truth is that many uh, professing Christians don't take sin seriously and don't think rightly about it. Some think of sin as something out there for really bad people. They acknowledge that they used to sin, and yes, they still do, but they can't name any sins. They haven't confessed any specific sins to God or anyone else in recent memory. Other Christians think that talking about sin diminishes the joy that we have in Jesus. But the reality is, the more that we see our sin for what it is, the greater the joy we can have in Jesus. Repenting of sin and rejoicing in Jesus go together. Others agree with that in principle, but they're so focused on their sin that they rarely do see Jesus and have joy in Him. They may believe mentally that Jesus died for their sins. They may even agree that repentance leads to rejoicing, but they don't live in the freedom of forgiveness. They feel sunk down, condemned, unclean. They see their sin, but it hasn't led them to have real joy in Jesus. So, here's what we need. We need to understand what sin does and what to do with it, what to do about it. So, Leviticus 4 and 5 show us that sin is not just an archaic term for made-up problems. It summarizes part of the human condition. Sin separates us from God. It defiles us. It damages and God alone is the one who's made a way for restoration through Jesus. And this way of restoration is pictured through two offerings that we'll look at this morning, the purification offering, some called, sometimes called the sin offering, and the restitution offering, or called the guilt offering sometimes. So, we'll read the first section of the sin or the purification offering, and then we'll read the restitution offering. So, Leviticus chapter 4. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to the people of Israel saying, if anyone sins unintentionally or inadvertently in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, and does any one of them, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he's committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. And the anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and bring it into the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord that is in the tent of meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the bull of the sin offering he shall remove from it, the fat that covers the entrails and the fat that's on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys, just as these are taken from the ox of the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn them in the altar of burnt offering. But the skin of the bull and all its flesh with its head, its legs, its entrails, and its dung, all the rest of the bull, he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place, to the ash heap, and shall burn it up on a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned up. And then this offering continues with if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, or a particular leader, or if any one of the common people sin. And then it gives... Specifics. Let's go ahead now to the guilt offering or the restitution offering. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth to it, and give it to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. If anyone sins doing any of the things that by the Lord commandments, Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent, for a guilt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally, and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. Chapter 6, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he had got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt." And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. Let's pray together. Our Father, we acknowledge that we need your help to understand your word, to receive it, to see how this matters for us right now. And so we pray that you'd help us by your spirit. And we pray that through the text that we just read and that we'll consider here, that you'd open our eyes to see your beauty in Jesus and the wonder of the way of restoration you provide. Amen. Well, this text is showing us what sin does and what to do about it. As we look at this, we have to remember where Leviticus fits in the big story. We have to see how it connects backward in history to Eden and ahead to Jesus 
be making this connection every Sunday in this series because you really can't understand Leviticus and why it matters to us today unless you understand how it relates to Eden before and Jesus after. So Eden was that perfect world that God made in the beginning, and then because of Adam and Eve's sin, humanity was sent out of Eden. And so now we're all outside of Eden, separated from God, continuing to break the peace or shalom of God's world and sin against Him. But in Leviticus, God is showing the way of restoration. So He rescued Israel from their slavery, had them build this tabernacle, and the tabernacle is this tent that's a symbolic Eden. It's an inbreaking of God's restored world into the midst of this broken world. But it's temporary and it's symbol laden for Israel because it's meant to teach something about the coming of Jesus and what he does for all humanity. And so it points forward to Jesus and how he restores the lost peace of the world. So Leviticus shows a system that God set up to point forward to Jesus. The more we understand Leviticus, this is true. The more we understand Leviticus, the more we'll understand Jesus. If you want to understand the beauty and wonder and glory of Jesus, one way you do that is by understanding the book of Leviticus, surprising as it may seem. So the first part of being restored to God in this temporary and symbol-laden way for Israel in Leviticus is through five offerings. So we saw the first three last Sunday. This morning, we're looking at the final two. So the, here's how they all fit together. The first three are a group together. So the burnt offering is for acceptance before God. The whole animal was burned. This picture of devoting our whole self to God and receiving acceptance through the sacrifice. The grain offering is the gift or tribute offering where we give to God what we have. And then the third offering is where everything's headed. This peace offering that we celebrated this morning with the Lord's Supper. This feast in God's presence with one another restored to God. An Edenic feast. So these first three offerings we saw last Sunday present the ideal picture of drawing near to God, acceptance, giving, feasting. But what happens when we sin? What does sin do to our relationship with God and others? How do we make things right? That's what the next two offerings deal with. This shows us what sin does and what to do with it. And in practice, typically, you're not going to offer the peace offering for that feast if you've sinned before you've dealt with it through the offerings we're looking at. In other words, you don't just waltz into God's presence with a peace offering if you sinned. You have to deal with that first, and that's what these offerings are for. And so, this is the sin offering or the purification offering and the guilt or restitution offering. This is God's way of restoration for sinners. The the picture here is of a vision of life where God's people regularly confess their sin receive His forgiveness, and when needed, make restitution for the wrongs they've done. And we enjoy the life pictured in the first three offerings, right, this life of acceptance and giving and feasting, when we've come to God and dealt with our sin first. And this is a regular rhythm of the Christian life as well. We deal with our sin before God, coming for fresh forgiveness through Jesus, And then we continue with our worship in all of life to Him. So these sacrifices show us what our sin does and what to do about it. We'll walk through these sacrifices um, all together, but in four steps. So we'll see the people uh, that make these sacrifices, and then the sins, and the results, and Jesus. So the people who make the sacrifices, the sins that need them, the results of the sacrifice, and then how they connect to Jesus. So first, the people. Who needs the sacrifices? Well, chapter 4 could have been one paragraph, the one that we read, but it goes on for quite a while after that. It could have just explained in one paragraph, hey, if anyone sins, here's the sin offering or the purification offering you do. Here's how you do it. Done. Moving on. But it doesn't do that. Instead, it explains how four different categories of people are to do this offering, and there's slight differences between them. So the first, the paragraph we read, is for a priest, perhaps the high priest, if he sins. Verse 3 says, if it's the anointed priest who sins, 
thus bringing guilt on the people because the priest uniquely and symbolically represents the people, then he shall offer for the sin he's committed a bull. This is the largest offering, the most expensive offering, a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. And then God gives instructions for how this offering is to be done. Then after the priest, the next paragraph, beginning in verse 13, is if the congregation of Israel sins. So it goes from the highest leader to then the whole congregation. And the word congregation here may refer to the whole people of Israel, or some say that this word refers to a defined leadership group within Israel. So if this leadership group of Israel sins, here's how the purification offering is to go. And then verse 22 begins the instruction for if an individual leader sins. And then verse 27 begins giving instruction for if a common Israelite, man or woman, non-leader, common Israelite sins, what they do about it. So there are four categories of people who need this purification offering when they sin. And then the next offering is the guilt or the restitution offering. It doesn't make these distinctions. We read the whole thing together. Anyone who sins in the ways related to that offering are included together. So who needs these offerings? Well, the most obvious answer is everyone. Everyone who sins. No one's outside of this. Anyone in any category may sin and then need this purification offering. But why split people up into those categories? Starts with the highest leadership responsibility and then goes down from there. Higher you are, the more expensive the animal is that you need to offer. Only the high priest or the whole congregation need to offer the bull. The more expensive then your offering needs to be and the more cleansing your sin requires. We won't get into a lot of the details throughout this morning, but the way that that this is written shows that your sin needs a greater level of cleansing depending on the higher, your higher responsibility or leadership level. So this could have been just one quick paragraph description for everyone, but there's a point here being made about sin. The higher level of leadership responsibility you have, the more responsible you are, and therefore, the more serious your sin is. The principle is all through the Bible. Jesus said, everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. James said, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So if God has entrusted you with a leadership responsibility, as he has in various degrees for most of us, as parents or leaders in a group or a classroom or leadership in a workplace or in a church setting, you have responsibility. You're to be an example, and your sin often affects a lot more people than it would if you weren't in that leadership role. You're held to a higher standard. And at the same time, we see that all of these people need sacrifice. So no one's excused here. No one can say their sin doesn't matter. Second, the sins. What requires a sacrifice? Well, there's several categories of sin addressed here. All of them are sins, and they all require sacrifice, but there are levels of seriousness. Now, you may think, what do you mean levels of seriousness? Aren't all sins equal? And maybe you've heard that. I've heard it often. All sin is equal. It's not true. I mean, yes and no. All sin is equal in the sense that all sin um, is sin, and it's offensive to God, and it's worthy of eternal condemnation, and it requires sacrifice. True. Um, However, not all sins are equally serious. Intent and results matter. I mean, like we just saw, depending on your leadership level, it's taken more or less seriously. So let me show you this. We'll talk about three categories of sin. Category one is what's often translated throughout chapter four, unintentional sins. It's all through chapter four. Look at the introduction to the purification offering in verse two. If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, and then it runs through different categories of people, the ones we saw, the priest, the congregation, the leader, a common Israelite. So what are these sins? Well, this could also be translated inadvertent 
sins. These are sins that you might do without even realizing it. Some have noted that this may refer to something like going astray um, or doing wrong. It's about how we can sometimes lapse or go astray or wander. So, it refers to someone who wants to obey God in general, but they still sometimes fail. Again, sometimes they don't even realize what they're doing. Other times they do, but it's a real moral lapse or failure. They go astray. They wander. This kind of sin is not from rebellion explicitly, but weakness. So, the first scenario in verse 3 is with a priest who commits one of these unintentional or inadvertent or straying-like sins. The second scenario in verse 13 is the congregation. So, that's either the large leadership group of Israel or the whole nation. Now, how could a nation or the leadership group sin inadvertently? How could everybody do that? Well, there's a situation in Joshua 9 that fits. So, Israel was in the land, and they weren't supposed to make a covenant with any of the people in the land. Those people were under God's judgment for centuries of wicked behavior, and they were to be judged, and Israel was going to be God's instrument for that. They weren't to make any covenants with them, but the Gibeonites tricked them by pretending to be a foreign nation. So, Israel covenanted with them, promised not to destroy them, but then they realized later what they did, and it was wrong. And so, this was unintentional or inadvertent, and it's still wrong. Then this goes on for the individual leader and then, you know, the common Israelite after that. So, in each case, the person realizes later either what they did that it was wrong or they realize, they kind of come to their senses and realize the gravity of what they've done. And they either either had no idea and then they find out what they did was wrong or they knew it was wrong, but then they were convicted about it. They realized how serious it was. Maybe God brought that conviction to their hearts. Maybe someone else brought it up. So, you and I sin this way as well. It's sometimes inadvertent, but it's serious. And if, and you don't realize it maybe until later or realize the weight of it until later. For example, you get angry and lose your temper in a moment. In that moment, you of course know it's wrong, but it's sometimes done with a suppressed kind of awareness, but then later you get convicted You see it clearly. You realize how terrible it was. You feel guilty and rightfully so. Or I remember when I was 10 years old, I was house sitting and the house, I was able to kind of hang out in that for a while. And I'm pretty sure they said, you know, play the video games if you want. And so I was 10 or 11 and they had an old Nintendo. I don't think I had that anymore. And they had Mike Tyson's Punch Out, which some of you know. That was a stellar game, and so I was really excited to play that, and I liked it so much, I was like, you know, I'm just going to borrow it while they're gone, and then I'll return it by the time they get back. And I'm sure they wouldn't have thought anything of that. It wouldn't have been a big deal, but um, they showed up a day early, and so I hadn't returned it yet. And I just remember feeling like, oh no, what am I going to do? They're going to think I stole it. I never did anything with it. I felt guilty. We moved away. We lost touch. I remember just never playing it, throwing it away. Um, So, I mean, it turned into functionally stealing, but it wasn't from a heart of rebellion, right? This is more of an inadvertent sin that I've kind of grown in my, grew in my awareness of what I had gotten myself into. So, that's the first category. They matter and they need sacrifice. They're wrong. The second category are, for lack of a better term, middle-level sins. These are somewhere between inadvertent sins and serious acts of rebellion. These are sins that we drift into or stumble into or fall into. We don't set out to do them in the sense that they're not premeditated evil, but we do them still out of moral weakness and waywardness. So, these are listed in chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. It's just a representative list of a few examples. That's how so much of the Old Testament law is meant to be read, is representative examples to get the idea to then apply to other situations. So, verse 1 is an example. If anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he's seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. So, this guy knows what he's doing. Right? This isn't like I had no idea and then later someone told me I did something wrong. No, he's supposed to testify about what he saw. And in that culture, I mean, there's no DNA test. There's no fingerprinting test. Witnesses really mattered for justice to be done. But he doesn't come. Maybe he's afraid of the consequences. Maybe he's threatened by an opposition party. Maybe he took a bribe. 
Another example is verse 4, uttering a rash oath. So you make a rash oath and you know what you're doing, but then later you realize just how foolish it was and you regret it. This kind of sin happens when you may swear in anger or maybe the yelling in anger example I gave early better, earlier better fits here depending on its strength in your heart. Or you gossip, you share something with someone you know you shouldn't and then later you're convicted about it. Or lying, some people have an immature character and they lie and they don't feel the level of conviction that they should right away but they do know it's wrong and later regret it. Or lust, you want to honor God and women with your eyes and your heart and yet you're weak and you stumble on occasions. Again, any of these sins can be ratcheted way up or down depending on a number of circumstances and the level in which you act here. So these middle-level sins. The third category is what the Old Testament calls a high-handed sin. Numbers 15 contrasts unintentional or inadvertent sins with the high-handed kind of sin. The idea is that a high-handed sin is a blatant act of rebellion. It is a massively serious sin. You know it's wrong, and you just don't care. You're despising God, and you're essentially rejecting Him, right? This would be saying essentially, yes, I know Jesus says this. I don't care, right? It's functionally not following Jesus at all. So, the first two categories of sin happen because we're morally weak and wayward, High-handed sins happen from a heart of strong rebellion. It's saying, yes, God says this. I don't care. I'll do whatever I want. So those are the categories of sin. There's, of course, levels all throughout. The offerings here are for the first two categories. These offerings are for people who feel remorse. They repent. They recognize they've done wrong. They want God's forgiveness, and so they come to Him with a sacrifice. The third category for high-handed sins is not addressed here. The consequence for those sins in various places is being cut off from Israel, which is either banishment from the people or capital punishment, depending on what you've done. It's from a heart of rebellion against God. So, here's what all this shows us. All sin is sin, but not all sin is equally serious. All sin is offensive to God. Don't hear this at all as a minimization of the problem of all sin. Needing an infinitely worthy substitute in Jesus to take our infinitely strong punishment of hell. Yes, it all deserves judgment, but not all sins are equally as serious and evil. God recognizes that sometimes we sin out of ignorance or weakness. Sin becomes more serious depending on a number of factors. Uh, The Westminster Larger Catechism notes a number of these. I'm not going to read the paragraph here, but I encourage you to look it up. You can find it on Google, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 151. Lists a number of factors with a ton of Bible references where it's all coming from that note the factors that make certain sins more or less serious. So, for instance, depending on the person who sins, and their age, and their level of responsibility, and how much they should know better. Depending on who's the sin, who the sin is directly against, God, or directly against superiors, or the common good of many. Depending on the nature of the offense, and if it's contained in the heart, or if it breaks forth and breaks out with words or actions. So, those are the sins that require sacrifice, and in various degrees and measures. Third, the results. So, what do the sacrifices here actually accomplish? The sacrifices accomplish three things, especially as we, as we view them as connected and pointing forward to Jesus. Forgiveness, cleansing, and payment. So, first, forgiveness. This is the most obvious result of the sacrifices. And both of these sacrifices, the purification one and the restitution one, provide forgiveness. It's the repeated refrain throughout these chapters. For example, chapter 4, verse 20, the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. Their sins shall be covered. This forgiveness is portrayed in the sacrificial animal itself. So, the person is sinful and blemished, 
They bring an unblemished animal. They press their hand against the head of the animal, likely picturing this transfer of sins, or at the very least here, this identification that this animal is going to substitute itself for me. And then you kill the animal as a statement of saying, this is what I deserve. I should be killed coming into your presence, but this is going to take my place. It's a sobering moment. So we need forgiveness because of what sin does. It separates us from God. Back in Eden, God said that the result of sin is death. And that is what we experience or should experience having all sinned. And so we all deserve to die, but God is making a way for people to stay alive and in Christ stay alive forever by having a blameless substitute offered in their place. Second, cleansing. The first offering is often called the sin offering. It's also often called the purification offering, and that's because its primary purpose is purification or cleansing, and in particular, the cleansing of the tabernacle. So it's not just that the animal dies. Everything else that happens in this process is important as well. The blood is caught in a container by the priest, and then the priest does something peculiar with the blood. Verse 6 says he dips his finger in it, And then he sprinkles it in front of or on the veil of the sanctuary, right, toward God's presence here. And then inside the tabernacle, he puts the blood on the horns of the altar, the kind of raised up four corners of the altar of incense. So that's the altar inside the holy place where only the priest can go. And he's rubbing blood on there. Why is he doing that? The blood is being used for purification. It's viewed as a cleansing agent like a spiritual bleach. He's symbolically purifying the tabernacle with it. Now, why would he need to do that? What is being portrayed here in this symbol-laden structure? Well, he's doing that because sin is viewed as a pollution. It's viewed as something that makes things unclean or dirty or defiled. So, as people sin, they need cleansing, but the tabernacle becomes unclean, the dwelling place of God. When someone sins, it's like a pollution in the tabernacle. It's defiling it. It's making it dirty. And this residue is in the tabernacle where God dwells, and so it needs to be cleansed for God to remain with them. Now, what's interesting is that depending on the level of responsibility the person has, their sin's pollution goes deeper in, closer to God's presence. So, if it's a priest or the whole congregation the holy place further into this tabernacle structure uh, needs to be cleansed. If it's a common Israelite or a different random leader, the courtyard is the only thing that needs to be cleansed, the altar cleansed, altar in the courtyard. So here's the lesson for us. Sin pollutes and defiles. It creates an invisible spiritual smog around us. Now, modern people, of course, we can all be quick to dismiss this, But think about it. We have experiences, don't we, where we recognize that some places feel profoundly defiled? A murder happens in a home and nobody wants to buy it. In many cases, it's torn down. There's a defiling memory of that place and what happened there. And when some people do something terrible, they feel like an invisible dirt is stuck to them. Shakespeare portrayed it with Lady Macbeth. She rose at night as a sleepwalker because, because she had this uh, collaboration in a murder, and she kept washing her hands because she thought there was still blood on them. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Sin pollutes the tabernacle, and it's cleansed through the blood. The third result of the sacrifice is his payment. This is the emphasis on the guilt or the restitution offering. So that's from chapter 5, verse 14 through 6, 7. This lists a number of sins. We we read this whole section, and these sins do damage to someone. Some sins are ripping God off or ripping the priesthood off of the payment you're supposed to give and compensation through the offerings. Other sins are damaging other people, and the result is that some kind of compensation is needed. So this gives us an insight into sin as well. When we sin against somebody... There are many cases in which we need to make it right. 
We have to give compensation or restitution or reparation. This is a neglected biblical idea. And when I say reparations, I'm not weighing in here on our kind of current debate in our country about reparations right now. That's complicated, requires careful thinking. And the idea here in this text is not about guilt by association with, you know, a group based on heritage or culture or skin color. color. What this is addressing is the very clear personal offenses that you and I do that need to be repaired. Some examples are in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security, or th- so deceiving them in terms of something related to finances, or through robbery, or if he's oppressed his neighbor, or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, no, 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 this is mine. I've always had this. You didn't leave this here. So these are offenses against people. And they require compensation. When you sin against somebody like this, you have to make it right. And this restitution is to be given immediately. So verse 5 of chapter 6 says, He shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. Do you see that? You give back what you've taken or what you owe. You do it on the day you realize your guilt. And you add 20% just for the inconvenience of the whole thing. And then you give a sacrifice to God. The order there is really important. You give compensation immediately to the person you've wronged, and then you give your offering to God. Do you know why that's so important? You can't just say, God, I'm sorry, move on like nothing happened. If you have wronged someone, you have to make it right with them. I have a friend who stole a lot of things before becoming a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he immediately, as humiliating as it was, went back to every person he could think of to make it right and let them know that he took and see what he needed to do to give back. This whole kind of situation is what Jesus is most likely talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 when he says, if you're bringing an offering and you realize that someone has an offense against you, right? you've done something to wrong them and they are rightly offended and you've not made it right, you leave the offering and then you go make it right first. It's talking about this. If you have wronged somebody, Make it right first. Give back what you owe plus extra. That's the priority. Then you give your offering to God. So this whole principle applies to so many areas of life. It means that if you are wronging someone, you don't just come here and sing to God and pray and give your finances to God and confess to God and say, well, I'm forgiven. You confess to the person and you make it right. First, So this is directly against all hypocrisy. This is against anyone. This talks about robbery, talks about oppression. Anyone who abuses a spouse and yet pretends like everything's okay with God or just thinks, well, I've confessed it with God, so I'm fine. It's against someone who wrongs a spouse by having an affair and then thinking that confessing to God is enough. You don't need to tell the person you wronged anything about it. It's against someone who manipulates funds to get ahead financially and then comes and gives financially to God, to a local church, and thinks that's okay. So you make it right, then you make your offering. And the offering itself is payment as well. It's payment for your sin. You deserve death, and the animal dies in your place. So the sacrifices are for forgiveness for cleansing, and for payment because of what sin does. Sin separates you from God. Sin defiles and pollutes. And sin wrongs and requires payment. So this all leads to Jesus. God set all of this up in Leviticus to teach us ahead of time about Jesus. So we saw that everyone needs these sacrifices. We all need forgiveness. We all need cleansing and payment for our sins but we don't get it through these offerings. We don't get it through the blood of bulls and goats. We get it by coming to Jesus because he came to be the true 
purification offering and restitution offering. One of the texts that directly refers to Jesus as this is 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, we, we may miss this. So, in Hebrew language and thought, uh, the word for sin and sin offering are the same. And so, in the New Testament, when Paul refers to sin, he's sometimes referring to the sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is most likely one of these. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin. That means to be a sin offering. I don't know what it would mean for Jesus to have become sin. Some weird reflections have come from thinking that. This is most likely, for our sake, God made Jesus to be a sin offering who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hebrews 13, verses 11 and 12 refer to him as a purification offering as well, which is burned outside the camp. So you have a lot of these that refer to him as a purification or the restitution offering. Hebrews 13 says this, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in his crucifixion in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So Jesus came to deal with our sin, to bring forgiveness, to bring cleansing through his blood, also a neglected New Testament emphasis of what the blood of Jesus does for us, and payment. He dies in our place, and we're forgiven. His blood cleanses. The blood was to cleanse the tabernacle in Leviticus. Now the blood cleanses God's heavenly dwelling place and us as his tabernacle so that God can be dwelling among us. It removes the defilement and pollution of sin, and Jesus is the payment for our sin. He's the guilt or restitution offering. He pays the debt that we owe. So, this all shows us what sin does and what to do with it. Sin sin is not just like an archaic religious word that we can just get rid of. It's a reality. It explains the sense of guilt that humanity feels, this sense of defilement that we can feel, the sense of obligation to make things right when we've wronged people. Sin defiles, it pollutes, and it must be made right. And the sacrifices in Leviticus vividly illustrate ahead of time how God himself through Jesus will forgive us, cleanse us, and pay our debt. So what do we do with our sin? We bring it to Jesus. And this is for you if you've never done that, and it's also for Christians every day. So maybe you've never come to Christ before. You're invited to today. You have sin that deserves death. You have sin that has defiled you. Your sin has wronged God and others, and you're invited to come to Christ for forgiveness, for cleansing, and for your debt to be completely removed. You pray to Him and you ask Him to apply the death of Jesus to you. And for Christians, this is still relevant to you and I, uh, you and me every day. We sin every day, and just because we're already trusting in Jesus doesn't mean we don't need to deal with our sin. Yes, we are accepted and justified, totally, now and forever, but our sin still affects our relationship with God and the, the work of Christ is still applied to us in real time, moment by moment. Jesus himself told us to pray for forgiveness every day. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, pay the debt, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're to confess our sins and seek fresh forgiveness and cleansing. And if you've wronged someone with your sin, make it right. Pay them back. Adding 20% is not a bad idea either. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the clarity that you give us about ourselves. Thank you for helping us understand ourselves and what's going on in this world inside our mind and heart and how we live and affect other people. We thank you most of all for Jesus and that he is our offering. Amen.